All right, here we are at the Springford 8th grade center, getting ready to work on chemistry here. Here I am, camera's on, so I'm going to come around the side. I'm going to, given the abbreviated periods that we're going to have this week, well, if I use this video, I don't know if it'll be the same time, but this year in the year 2014, we have PSAs next week. So given the shortened periods and the amount of work we're doing, I've decided to make a supplemental video so you can watch and get extra reinforcement to allow you to have more time on the other material, which includes atomic radius, ionization energy, electronegativity, all that stuff. We'll spend more time in class on that next week, along with the, uh, with the electron configurations. So let's get the other stuff out of the way. We've covered most of it, but here's a nice review just so you have it, especially given the fact that our periods are being cut short due to the PSSA. All right, so we talked about a couple things, and it's really helpful if you have this itinerary that's here for you. We talked about that all matter is made of atoms, and we said to you before that cells are made of a lot of atoms. Okay, so cells are made of atoms. Inside the nucleus of an atom, okay, a nucleus has protons, neutrons. The nucleus is positively charged. Okay, the nucleus just itself is positively charged because the protons and neutrons, which comprise the mass of the atom, mostly, um, are positively charged protons. Neutrons are neutral charged. Outside the nucleus, you've got negative charged particles called electrons. And for an atom, an overall charge of an atom is neutral. That's huge, okay? An overall charge for an atom is neutral because the electrons on the outside of the nucleus are negative. The protons and the neutrons form a total positive charge inside the nucleus because, again, the protons are positive, the neutrons are neutral. And for an atom to be an atom, you've got to have the same number of protons as electrons, the same number of positive thingies as negative thingies to give you an overall neutral charge. So shout out to period three. You know who you are. I guess we came up with the song. How did it go? Nucleus is positive. How did it go? No. Nucleus is positive. Atoms are neutral. Atoms are neutral. Nucleus is positive. I, something like that. It was actually really good. Um, ask somebody from period three. They'll sing it to you. Nucleus is positive, atoms are neutral. Nucleus is positive, I think they did this. Nucleus is positive, atoms are neutral. Nucleus is positive, atoms are neutral. Say it to yourself, please don't forget it. Okay, here we go. Then we talked about John Dalton and Bohr diagrams. And you need to understand that <coughs> atoms, okay, make up everything pretty much in the universe. All right, and we're gonna talk about the structure of an atom a little bit more and we're also going to talk about the periodic table. Um, we also know with an atom we have an atomic number. Atomic number is the number of protons in an atom. Okay, in an atom. You've got the atomic mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons in an atom. But what about the atomic mass? We talked about that. The atomic mass is decimal. It's slightly different. That's the average of all different forms of atoms and isotopes of that element, their mass. And if you think about it, we talked about carbon. Six protons, six neutrons, the atom. That's the most abundant form of carbon. That's the atom. So that's mass of 12, but its mass is 12.011. Takes, takes into account carbon uh, 13 and carbon 14. Carbon 13 has one more neutron. That's an isotope where the number of neutrons, you add one more, two more, whatever neutrons to the original form of the atom. That's an isotope. So carbon 12 is the atom, six protons, six neutrons, mass of 12. Carbon-13, which is very much less abundant, six protons, seven neutrons, okay? The atom has six neutrons, it's has seven. Carbon-14, even more rare, six protons, eight neutrons. So you take all that into account, the abundancy, and come up with the atomic mass, okay? And again, isotopes, different number of neutrons. Atomic number again, number of protons, okay? Then we talked about differentiating between an atom and an ion. An atom is neutral. Ions are charged. And again, hey, shout out to period three. Our friends in period three, we talked about ions have an electrical charge. So we thought of it. We're like, how? Hey, when you say ion, I -I 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 on. Sounds like I'm getting an electrical shock out of a wall. Don't do that at home. I -I 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 ions, electrical charge. They can either be positively charged or negatively charged. If they're overall positively charged, that means they lost a negative electron. So they have more positive particles, protons, than negative. And if they gained electrons, that means they got more negative thingies, negative particles, right? So they're overall negative. 
So the positive ion that lost electrons is a cation. Okay? I'm positive I dislike cats. I like cats, but I'm just saying that to help you remember that. Anions, a negative ion. Anions were called anions by one kid a couple of years ago. It's funny. A n i o n s, a negative ion. They gain electrons, and the type of electrons we're talking about are valence electrons. Why am I leaving the camera right now? Because I want to show you the periodic table. And again, valence electrons are the outermost, outermost electrons that are involved in chemical reactions. Okay, I think I'm getting better at this. Hold on, I'm raising this up here. Whoa. I hope this tripod doesn't fall off. Okay, that'll do for now. Okay, good. Now I'm going to be in some of this picture, I think. Okay, here we go. Good. Now, let's get this done. That's called a periodic table, right? In case you didn't know. And we have a saying for that. The original periodic table developed by Dmitry Mendeleev was arranged by atomic mass. And we have a saying, mom, M. Mendeleev, O. Old, M. Mass. Mendeleev old mass. Modern periodic table. Man. Modern arranged by increasing atomic number. M-A-N. So old periodic table is mom. M-O-M. Mendeleev old mom. And if I'm like half cut off the camera, guess what? I'm not a professional camera person. Sorry. Mendeleev old mom. Mass, right? Old mass. Modern atomic number. M-A-N. Okay. So the overall periodic table in each square Hopefully you guys can see this right here. Here's beryllium, and here's lithium. Okay, lithium here, here's beryllium. Let me double check and make sure that focus is in. Again, this is a one-man show here. Hold up, I wanna make sure that first group is in there. Oh, perfect, okay, good. So anyway, back over here. This right here is a group or family. We'll talk about that in a second. Inside each square, you generally see the atomic number, number of protons of the atom of that element, a symbol, uppercase, lowercase, one or two letters, and the atomic mass down here, usually in decimal form. Sometimes you also have the name and a lot of other information beyond that. This is fine for our purposes at this point. So inside a square, you get information about that atom, uh, that, excuse me, that element. But here's the important thing. The periodic table is arranged by horizontal rows in groups, vertical columns, groups. Get this in your head. Rows are horizontal. Groups, vertical columns. Columns are vertical here. Okay, when I was a kid, I always screwed that up. Columns are vertical, rows are going to be horizontal here. Okay? So here we go. We have this first group right here. It's a group or family. You have lithium here. Okay? Elements in a group or family, a vertical column, have a lot in common. They have the same number of valence electrons, the outermost are electrons that are involved in chemical reactions. Therefore, they react the same way, okay? Elements in a period across are arranged by increasing atomic number. And in this case, increasing number of valence electrons, which I'll show you on the board in a minute. So we always ask, what does lithium, who is lithium more in common with, sodium or beryllium? The answer is sodium. Na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye sodium. So again, elements in a group or family are more closely related than a period. So vertical column, group or family. In high school, I think they use the term groups more often. Horizontal row period. Okay? So we have the song. We are family. Hey, hey, hey. I got all my valence with me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. To remind you, in a family, valence is the same. They tend to react the same way. Okay? So here we go. Overall periodic table, we've got all the way to that red zigzag right there. To the left of that, metals. Most of the periodic table is made of metals. Okay? At the zigzag, you've got metalloids. Metalloids show properties of both metals and nonmetals depending on the conditions. We'll talk about those conditions in class. To the right of the zigzag over there, yes, I can reach that, you've got nonmetals, okay? And there is right over there to the right of the zigzag. All right, so take a look back over here. Metals, the reactivity trend of metals are as follows. I'm going, giving the basics. The reactivity, and the reason why these elements of these atoms react is to get a full outer shell to become stable. The reactivity is the greatest. The most reactive metals are right here. They're called the alkali metals. They have one valence electron, group one. One valence electron, one away from becoming stable. Nuts, crazy. Group two, alkaline earth, two words, metals. 
have two valence electrons. Very, I mean, very violently reactive, but these are the most. In the middle here, the middle of the periodic table, you got transition metals. Okay? How do transition metals usually react? They may like tarnish or rust. So we go from spontaneously combustible, fire, explosive, to rust in the middle of the periodic table. So not, again, another classic song. For all you people in high school watching this, you'll remember this one. There's a group called Kansas, and I'm here with my bibliography. I'm giving them a shout out. Hey, Kansas, I'm giving you a shout out here. They had a song called Dust in the Wind. So I was telling my kids, I'm like, oh, interesting. Kansas is in the middle of the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Where are the, the uh, transition metals? Middle of the periodic table. They have a song called Dust in the Wind. All we are is dust in the wind. It's kind of a sad song. I've decided to alter that. The transition metal song. All you high school people, here you go. Sing it right now. You know what it is. It goes, rust in the wind. All we are is rust in the wind. So we go from crazy explosive reactive, pretty darn reactive to maybe rust and tarnishing. Okay, so reactivity decreases from left to right. That's why you see gold. My wedding ring right here. My finger hasn't exploded yet. Okay, it's still there. All right? May have tarnished a little bit, if anything. All right? So we'll talk about that. We're going to learn about alloys eventually. And you'll notice that a lot of platinum, gold, a lot of these metals are silver, useful in nature because they're durable. Okay? They may tarnish, but they're useful. Okay? Then we get to the zigzag over here. On the border, we got metalloids, and we'll talk about metalloids with semiconductors. We'll get to that in a minute. To the right, you've got the nonmetals. So here's the boron family here, which is a mix. Metalloid, metal, 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 metal. Three valence electrons. Carbon family has a mix of everything. Okay, peanut butter and lead sandwich, cinder like tin, carbon. Group 15, nonmetal. Non-metal, nitrogen, phosphorus, okay? And then here's the rest, metalloids and metals. Um, these guys here get a little more reactive. Here, oxygen family, acetipo, these guys get a little more reactive. Over here are called the halogens, oh my gosh. These are the most reactive non-metal family, okay? They've got seven valence electrons. All they need is one more to become stable. They're that close. So instead of calling them halogens, they have kind of a goofy name. We call them halogens. They're nuts. Crazy. Kind of like me, I think. Yeah. Okay. And finally, we have over here the snobs, the noble gases, except for a little outcast up there. <laughs> Helium is a little strange. Okay. Helium, first off, I always you to say, <laughs> to help you remember, HE is helium, because when you inhale helium, you get that funny voice. But also, helium is kind of funny because it's part of the noble gases, but it's got two valence electrons, the rest had eight. That's why helium's laughing. <laughs> They're all inert, they do not react. Inert, I-N-E-R-T means do not react. Because they have a full outer shell. They don't need a valence electron. They don't have to give any away. They have what they need. They're not going to interact with anyone. No one wants to bother, no, they don't want to bother anyone. But helium, it's full outer shell instead of eight, it's two. Because the first level can hold two, and we talked about that in class. So helium's a little bit strange, but still a noble gas. So we came up with a song this week about the full outer shell. And for years I've always thought, how can I get a way to remember that? Well, here you go. It's kind of corny, but pretty much everything we do in here is corny, so who cares? All I want for science is a full outer shell. A full outer shell. Yeah, a full outer shell. Gee, if I could only have a full outer shell, then I would be a stable substance. Substance. Reason being, and you'll learn about this later, ionic compounds. When they bond together, they're stable. Molecular compounds through a covalent bond or even a hydrogen bond, when they bond together, they share electrons, they become stable. What about diatomic molecules where one bonds with itself? That's just a molecule, it's not a compound. Initially, I was going to say that I could be a stable compound, but that doesn't cover me for diatomic molecules where they bond with themselves, which we'll learn about next chapter. And then I said, molecule just didn't have that good ring. Listen, then I could be a stable molecule. Uh, no. We'll just say substance. So again, sing it at home, get the family around the, the computer. Here we go. One, two, three. All I want in science is a full outer shell. Yeah, a full outer shell. Ooh, a full outer shell. Gee, if I could only have a full outer shell, 
that I could be a stable substance. There you go. So the whole point of...